This is testing across the stacks, an intro to testing both the UI and API layers together. Um, I'm Hilary Weaver-Rab. I'm a senior software engineer um, in test uh, at Quicken Loans in Detroit. Uh, I run the Motor City Software Testers User Group in Detroit, which is partnered with Ministry of Testing. And I am geek lady all over the internet. So, and, and I like moose. <laughs> Um, so when I got started in testing almost 14 years ago now, um, I was really only learning about UI testing. I had no idea about anything else. Like that's, that's where I was kind of put and that's, that's what I learned. But when I started to learn how to blur the lines between front end testing and back end testing, I started to actually understand how things fit together. Um, I found bugs before the UI was done. I was, um, finding bugs earlier in the process and providing support for my application because I actually understood more about the application. I suddenly was the go-to person for how my application worked. Not any of the developers somehow, like everything just kind of fell into place. So today, first I want to level set on some definitions around APIs. Then we'll talk about why test them some HTTP response codes and how they fit into our testing. We'll find the API calls that our UI is making and then see how some UI tests translate to API tests. So first, level setting. So what is an API? An API stands for Application Programming Interface. It is what allows other programs to talk to a program. So I found this simple diagram that is pretty helpful in explaining an API. Um, so their explanation is, you know, Bob wants a pizza, so he sends a request for a pizza on his phone, maybe with an app. Tony, Tony's Pizza, has pizza. So he, on, his, on that app, receives that request and sends um, Tony his pizza, or it sends Bob his pizza. So your application acts in a similar way. Your application sends a request for data to maybe a database with the API. The database gets that request and sends a response. Essentially, APIs help developers interact with each other's code and reuse code that someone else wrote. It really helps keep developers from having to reinvent the wheel every time. For instance, an app that requires pinch zoom on your phone. Every developer didn't have to write that themselves every time. There's an API from your phone operating system that provides that. Interacting with printers. Um, not every application had to write how to figure out how to interact with an HP printer. HP has an API for that. Google Ads. Google Ads has an API for that. Facebook authentication, same thing. And apps that send push net notifications, the same thing. Your app, when you write an app, you don't have to figure out how to do that every time. There's an API that does that for you. And the same with validating street addresses. So what is a web service? You may have heard web service and API both uh, separately or interchangeably. A web service is machine to machine interaction over a network, um, such as HTTP. A web service needs a network connection while an API may not. And all web services are APIs, but not all APIs are web services. So those APIs that we mentioned earlier may or may not be web services. Let's take a look at them and talk about why. So something that is an API, but not a web service necessarily. The app that requires pinch zoom, interacting with printers, sending push notifications, those can all be off the network. Um, you don't need a network connection to use pinch zoom on your phone. If you've been in airplane mode, you've done that, it works. Interacting with printers, you can plug into a printer. It doesn't have to be over the web. Um, and sending push notifications. Uh, if you've been you know, on a, a cruise or something, you had no network uh, connectivity, but you still get those push, those annoying push notifications from your, your apps. It doesn't need um, a network, so it's not necessarily a web service. But web services, uh, Google Ads on your website, it needs to be able to talk to Google. 
So that needs a network connection. Same with the Facebook authentication. Validating a street address. Those are, there's a, the US Postal Service has an API, a web service for doing that. Um, and again, interacting with printers, it can be both because like my printer, um, I use it over Wi-Fi. So I print to it over Wi-Fi. Yes, I own a printer. Uh, it's, not, it's kind of rare these days, but um, that's something that it can be a web service as well. Types of web services, um, REST, SOAP, GraphQL, you, you may have heard of a number of these, but we're gonna be focusing on REST web services. Um, they're a bit easier to get through the concepts of. The URL tells you what you're working with and what you're doing. Um, so it's, it's much easier to understand what's going on. Uh, the messages can be lightweight. They can even just be the URL. Um, it doesn't always have to have a, a big chunk of a request that goes with it. Um, like SOAP requires a big um, a SOAP envelope. And again, it's a good basis for these concepts. Just know when you're encountering and testing web services uh, in the wild or at work, um, you should get to know what type it is so you can ex further explore how those types of web services work. One concept you need to know is CRUD, or Create, Read, Update, Delete. Our CRUD operations are handled by HTTP methods that some, or sometimes are referred to as verbs. So the create, for creating data, we do an HTTP post. For reading, we do an HTTP get. For update, we do a put, and delete is delete. There are other HTTP methods that are used, but these are, um, very common and these are the most important for you to understand for this um, session. Another facet of web services and REST in particular is the client server architecture using HTTP protocol. That sounds like a lot of jargon, but really it means the client is sending a request to the server over HTTP and the server sends a response back also over HTTP. So here's an example. I'm sitting at my computer and I type into Google, show me the cutest dog on the internet. And I hit search. So that search, me hitting that search button sends a request to Google's servers through the API. It does all of this stuff or whatever and does the search. And then when it comes back, it finds my dog, Cooper, because um, he is the cutest dog on the internet. He has an, an Instagram if you need it, let me know. Um, and he will be here later in the presentation as well. So why test APIs? You have an API, and no matter if it's being consumed by your own user interface with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or with someone else's code, or simply an API client like Postman, this is still code that needs to be tested. And what about people that turn off JavaScript? It doesn't, I don't think it happens very much anymore but um, it's still a possibility. So people can turn off JavaScript, and if that is the only place where you're validating uh, someone's data, they can still break your application and give you bad data. Um, so that uh, is another reason why APIs are, are important to check separately from the UI. Uh, APIs are often completed before the UI is even started. Not everyone wants to use the UI, especially if you're someone that is used to coding and maybe someone coded up a, a website that's really slow, but you know you can get the information that you need from the API. That's You're the type of person that's gonna go for the API first. You can validate the ductwork, validate how the application works from um, the bottom instead of the top. Um, UIs can pull in multiple APIs. So if you're only testing from the UI, you're touching on so many different moving parts. Um, it can be really hard to find where an issue is if one comes up. And we test it because it's code. There are many layers to our applications and we don't want to ignore any of them. You wanna make sure you're testing a good ratio. You don't wanna ignore one for the other. So you wanna find the right ratios for your project. And hopefully this talk will help you to think about how you can test your application differently and maybe more efficiently and effectively. So
So HTTP response codes and how they fit. HTTP response codes and HTTP is hard to say every time. Um, they indicated HTTP request is successful or not. So if we made the request properly or not, or if the web request, if the web service or API can handle what we requested. These are useful in our testing because we can understand how it was written. Um, we may even expect a different response code than what we got. And uh, I have put in many a bug for getting the incorrect response code back. Um, there are about 70 response codes total, but they fall into these categories. There's informational 100s, the successful 200s, redirects are 300s, client errors are 400s, server errors are 500s. So if you Google HTTP response codes, you'll most likely run across HTTP status cats, which is basically pictures of cats to represent each of the status codes. I did the same thing with my dog. So you'll see more of him now. For the success status codes, or the 200 levels, the most common ones are 200 okay. Everything is okay, nothing to do, you did great, we did great. 201 created, you asked us to create something, and we did so without error. 204, no content. We did what you asked, but we didn't need to send any response other than the code. For the redirection codes, or the 300s, we have 303, see other. Generally, you try to get something from the resource, but it's available under a different URL. And then 307, temporary redirect. Resource you want is temporarily moved to another URL. Um, client error codes, where your request isn't quite right for a number of reasons. So we have 400 bad requests, generally bad syntax. The request itself is malformed. So you sent something that we weren't really expecting. 401 unauthorized, the request requires you to send authentication information. So you're either you're sending, um, you're sending something that doesn't have the, the um, expected authorization. 403 forbidden. Either the server refuses to fulfill the request and authentication or authorization won't help you. Basically, stop trying to do what you're doing. You can't get through. 404 not found. We've all seen these. The thing you're looking for isn't here or it doesn't exist. And 408 request timed out. Server timed out waiting for the request. Repeat that request and see what happens. And then the dreaded 500s, the server error codes. These are the ones where either it was totally unforeseen circumstance or the application is just not handled to handle the, not coded to handle these scenarios. We have the 500 internal server error. Um, it's a generic catch-all error when the server throws an exception. So if I see these when I'm expecting like a 404 or something, I'm putting a bug in right away because this is kind of silly. This is, it should be handled properly. In 503 service unavailable, the server is temporarily unavailable either due to maintenance or it's been overloaded. So how can we test APIs? There are a lot of tools out there to test web service and APIs. There are manual testing tools such as Postman, Fiddler, Advanced REST Client, et cetera. On automation tools, Postman has automation ready API and most unit testing frameworks can handle um, automated testing over the internet like of APIs, not just unit testing. Today, we're going to be working with Postman and DevTools to um, test our API. So why do we need these tools? Why can't we just test an API? APIs need some form of interface for us to test them. They're kind of um, in the ether, in the network, and, and we can't really see them unless we have some kind of a, an API client. So we need a client to make the request um, and deal with the HTTP protocols, receive the responses, um, handle headers, cookies, all of the other things that an API or a, a web service might need. And not all APIs have a UI function that is correlated to it. Um, so there are some APIs or web services, there's no UI to use. So you have to have some kind of client to, to test with. So like Postman or something. What types of tests can we perform on an API? 
basically all the same as a regular user interface, any other kind of test, even usability testing. Someone or something is consuming your API, so it should be usable. We'll look at some of our common tests in the UI and how they translate to the API in a little bit. So now how can I figure out what to test? Um, there's all kinds of ways we can learn about our API and start figuring out how to test it. It's all essentially some kind of documentation just in different forms. So the, there's plain old documentation, which someone took the time to write uh, manually, generally. Swagger or open API, this is automatically generated. Um, you have something in your, uh, like some kind of a library that generates this for you, uh, depending on how your API is defined. A Waddle or a WSDL, which is an XML definition, um, is generally automatically generated as well. And RAML, the same thing. It's a RESTful API modeling language. Uh, it's a, in a YAML type uh, format. So it's also automatically generated. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, the Swagger or the Open API for our API. So let's take a look at that right now. Here's our, our very simple application. The Swagger definition, the Open API definition is here. So this is a very simple API. We have we get a list of all to-do items and it returns a 200. If it's successful, returns a list of all to-do items in this format. Um, if you're missing authorization, it returns a 401. We can do a post to create a new one, which has a potential 201. Uh, get of a single one, same. Put is an update. So updates a single to-do item and you need to provide all of the fields. And it's response 201 returns the updated to-do item. There's a couple other possible responses if things are not formatted correctly, whatever. So this was automatically generated from the definition of the API controller um, in my code. And I, I used a, a NuGet package called Swashbuckle to generate the swagger for me. So that, this is a cool way to get to know the application and you can also try it out. We have some authorization we have to do for this one, um, but generally you can try out the request and it will make the request for you because I don't have an authorization. I should get a 401 back. And here's my response. And it shows you the request that was made. So you can actually copy this and do it at the command line. You can use curl as your HTTP client. So other ways we can figure out what to test is checking out the code, looking at the controllers. The controllers tell the API what to do, how to run the, the calls that it is receiving um, models, tell the API what the data look like, looks like that it will accept or send. And if there are any tests, unit tests or integration tests that are already there, that is a great way to figure out how it should work, um, how it's expected to work and how you can test it. So we know more about the API a little bit, um, but how is our UI using the API? What does this information in the documentation really mean? And how does that translate to how the app API is, is actually used by the UI? So this is where we're gonna use dev tools. In most browsers, these commands like F12 or Control Shift I or Command Option I will bring up um, dev tools. You can also go to the options window. Um, and we're going to be using Chrome for this just to, to have kind of a level set there. So for our demo, what we're going to do is look at the network tab in dev tools and see how the API is used when we load the page, when we create a new item, when we edit an item and delete an item. And I'm going to hit F12 to open dev tools. And I have a 404 for a fave icon because I don't have a fave icon for this application. So we're going to see what, this is the network tab here. Usually you land on the elements tab. This is the network tab. So this is going to show all of the network calls that are being made when you load the page. So because I opened this after the page was loaded, it doesn't have anything. So let me refresh and we'll see what API calls are made. So we can see actually some other kinds of calls being made as well. Script, document, these are other kinds of code like the HTML, the CSS, all of that stuff. We can tell when it's an API call, this XHR. Okay, so we see we have our to-do, get, 
here. Let's open that up. So we can see here with our request, and we have different sections that we have. We have headers, preview, response, initiator, timing. Under headers, we can see the actual request that was made. This is just the general request. So we have the URL, we have the request method, and we have the response. So this is just get all to-do items. And then if I scroll down, I can see, see the request headers here, the method, the path, Here's our authorization in plain text, which is great, um, not very secure. If we go to this preview tab, this is my favorite way to look at the response. Because if you go to the response here, it's going to show it in the raw JSON. But from the preview tab, I can see things kind of in a nicer arrangement. So if I expand one of these, I can see the date two, the ID is complete flag, and the name is walk the dog. So that is the first one here, walk the dog. And then we have feed the dog, walk the cat, feed the dog, walk the cat. So all of this data matches which, with what we have here. So if I add a new to-do item, feed the moose, because I like moose. So we do that. And then today's date, or no, we'll go in the future and add. So I can see the post here. And then we had a get that happened after. So we have a post which returned a 201 response. And then we had the subsequent get of all to-do items to kind of load the page. So the JavaScript says, get me all the to-do items. A new one was created. I want to show all the latest. And that's what happens there. So here's our post. And we have our request like we showed before. But down at the bottom, we can see the request payload. So this is what was sent, the request body that was sent to the API in the JSON format, and you can click view source to see the full JSON, and this, this is kind of just a nice view. So that was the data. And then we can see up here a couple of things. So we can see that it was a post. You can see it got a 201 response. 201 is created. So good job, you created something. Um, and then the response headers shows here our location. So that means this is an ID of four. So this is the fourth thing um, that we have. And that is the ID. If we want to do a get of a single item and get that, that new one that we created, we use this URL to find that location. And then when we go to the to do, get all to do items. If we look at the preview, we can see that ID of four is indeed be the moose. So that is kind of how, uh, just a quick view through how our UI uses the API. Some notes, all browsers have dev tools. Uh, some have more features than others. Some have extensions to those, like Firefox has a Firebug with lots of extensions to it. Other web proxy tools exist, so you don't need to be in a browser. So if you have a, an app on your phone that you want to test, you can use tools such as Fiddler, Charles Proxy, Wireshark, um, or even a desktop application. It doesn't have to be um, in the browser to use these kinds of tools. And note that not all API calls are made with the UI. Sometimes um, there's a backend kind of service that does the, that work for it. Um, so you're not always going to get everything from dev tools or from the UI, but those should still be in the Swagger. So now we can translate some UI tests to API tests. The, again, the types of tests that we can perform, um, we don't have time for all of these, obviously. So uh, let's look at an example of security tests, such as cross-site scripting. Uh, we think of that as something you can only do in the UI, but that is not the case. With the UI, we might enter a name with a cross-site scripting attack and submit. And it would be successful because the bad characters are stripped uh, in the JavaScript. With the API, we might make the request with name with a cross-site scripting attack. Um, we would hope for 200 and that the bad characters are stripped as well from the API. And testing together, we might make requests via the API with the name with the cross-site scripting attack, and then check how the UI responds to it. So we, we're seeing how they work together. 
Um, and that's actually what we're going to demo. Uh, there's a couple other things that we can do. Uh, I think we have time for cross-site scripting and maybe required fields. I don't think we have time for the boundary test. A great cross-site scripting attack um, to do, just to test. And it, it's not really going to break anything, but it's just is checking um, whether there is some protections or not for the specific type of values. So something like this, there's a, you know, an open uh, caret here. So this is a good example of, this is code that if JavaScript is able to process it, it will pop up an alert window that says testing it. So if our UI is handling this properly, then we won't see that pop up and these special characters will get escaped. So we click add, cross our fingers. Okay, so that was added. It doesn't look like they're stripped in the UI, but let's look at what our get all items looks like. We can see they are actually stripped, so or they're escaped. So the UI is interpreting them, but the JavaScript isn't processing it like a command. So that is good. This is this is what we want to see. Now let's try it from um, the API. Let's do a post of a single to-do item. We need to add our can this header. So our request body, we only need to send the name and we're going to send, mouse isn't working. We're going to send the exact same string, uh, but let's change this just so that we can differentiate between what's already in uh, the UI and what's not. So here is our post request. So we're going to create a new to-do item with the name of this script. Let's hit send. Okay. I know we're going to have a problem because this is the response. So here's our idea six. And these values are not escaped. This is the raw script. Yikes. So when we go to here, let's refresh the page and see what happens. Yeah. Before it was able to get everything else, it processed this JavaScript alert that says, oh no. Um, and then if we click OK, it's not there. And it's, it's just a, it's a total mess. Um, so we have a cross-site scripting vulnerability in our API. Our UI is handling things fine, but hackers don't just use the UI. They use the API as well. So testing across the stacks. Each layer of our application has been written by a number of different people, potentially. And people make assumptions about how other people do things and how those application will be used. As we've seen, that can lead to some security issues, if not others. We need to test both sides because both have different types of users and different uses. And as we saw, we need to handle data validation across the stacks. Think about the future with the API, especially. What if you decide to develop an app for this to do um, this terrible to do <laughs> site that you have, you want to develop an app instead. You don't want to write a whole new application. You're going to use the same API. So how is that app going to be used differently potentially from the website? Um, and how can people use the API differently than they use the UI? Like for example, that get a single to do item, they could potentially use that with the API even though the UI doesn't use it. So. I encourage you to improve your testing across the stacks by learning about the API with documentation, from the code, with dev tools in the browser, and give the API some testing love, both alone and with a friend. Um, my resources, the API that we tested today um, is available in GitHub. Um, I use it for a number of different workshops and courses. So there's a, a Docker image even available of it. Um, there's links and the slides are there as well. So um, I'm Hillary and thank you very much.